my life I've loved miniature railways and narrow gauge railways. And there have been three main influences, three main things that have inspired my passion for these railways. The first one was this. This is a little 009 de Koval, which I had when I was young and was the basis of my model railways at home. The second thing was Sean and Katie, the twin engines that ran on the 15-inch gauge Fairbourne Railway. And the third, and probably the biggest influence on my love of railways, was the Hilton Valley Railway. A seven and a quarter inch railway, privately built and privately run, that used to open to the public every Sunday. And my father used to bring me and my brother as an eight-year-old boy here on a Sunday afternoon where we'd ride round on the trains and as a treat we'd be allowed to turn the engines on the turntable in the station and still get back in time for Evensong. Sadly, the railway closed in 1979. However, thanks to the hard work of a 20-year-old lad, it's coming back to life. the 20 year old lad who's actually making this happen. Now Ben we'll be getting on to talk about Loco's stock and, yeah. and in fact what you're doing here right. but meanwhile uh, my recollections of this railway are a brief period five yeah. six years late 60s early 70s right but the railway had already been around quite a long time by then. Yeah it, I mean the railway started uh, in a small way in 1957 um, started with just two locomotives. The first, Lorna Doon, Michael Lloyd found while he was out on business. Um, and the second locomotive, number four, uh, battery electric, was constructed uh, using his employees at the works, uh, which he worked at F.H. Lloyd's. Um, the line went to Hilton Household, first run round loop on the line. Um, Hilton's Hilton Household, two run round loops. But uh, it was soon found, the sheer amount of people that were travelling on the railway, that the rolling stock he had, which was simply bench coaches, very, very basic, uh, that he had to improve the quality of the stock. He was already limited by the gauge, seven and a quarter inches, so he had to just make the maximum he could do with that. It was an extraordinary railway then, and particularly so for two young boys from, from Birmingham I bet, who yeah. really, really wanted to drive a steam engine more than anything else. Yeah. At what stage did the uh, railway complete, if you see what I mean? The line peaked in operation, both in loop line length of the line and rolling stock, around 1972. We got the introduction of the cover carriages. We're running Stratford Brook. Um, so by that time, unfortunately, Michael Lloyd tragically died in 1973. Um, and not a lot of further development happened until the railway's closure in 1979. Um, Michael Lloyd's son, Dan, operated the railway then. It's true to say, isn't it, that, that actually this railway, the Hilton Valley Railway, uh, was a real leader in the development of seven and a quarter passenger carrying railways, wasn't With, it? Without a doubt. And that's probably my biggest interest within it. Um, if you look at the locomotives, they're so different, even today when you see a modern seven and a quarter inch engine, um, they're, they're big today. But you've got to imagine, in, in the 50s and 60s, um, there just wasn't the knowledge. The seven and a quarter society was in a very embryonic form. And a lot of what happened here was by trial and error. One of our locomotives, number six, um, originally a steeple cab, uh, where the driver sat very high in the cab and there was no footwell or anything and there was a lot of problems with it coming off at speed and it was later rebodied with a footwell and certain alterations were made as time went on it was sort of a learn on the job yes and it, uh, I would also go further to say that it laid the foundation stone for so many major miniature railways uh, today yes. my own interest is in ten and a quarter right but the inspiration was 100% 
from here, from the Hilton Valley. Yeah. Uh, a wonderful uh, achievement mm. from from start to finish this mm. this place yeah it's so magical the way you know the railway runs by the stream and all the sheds as well with the timber the way the track goes just in between them so indeed this place uh, for me was where, where i first learned to love the smell of of steam hot steam oil and and all that and indeed i i very much remember the smell of the creosoted sheds yes, that, yeah. that we had there. Yeah, the, the character was just extraordinary. Mm. I do remember it used to flood a lot, however. Oh, yes. Um, the flooding is, is still today a, a serious issue. When buildings railway, it's something that we've had to consider quite, quite seriously. Here we are, the old track bed of the Hilton Valley Railway. Yeah, here it is. It's your story now. How did it start for you, mate? Well, it started a long time ago, um, when I was younger than nine, I think. And I remember we were at, at a house just up the road. Um, and I went to where this railway uh, went, Western Park, and I saw the railway running. And I happened to say to the chap there, oh, I'm moving house. And he said, oh, where are you moving to? And I said, oh, just down the road, big old place, uh, Hilton House. And he said, Hilton House, he said, take a look around you, all the stock here and all the railway. That came from there. So uh, that inspired me then to try and twist my parents' arm, say, please, can we move here? And we just about did it. At the age of nine? <laughs> yes. We started off with a little railway on the lawn and we were running trains on there. And great fun was had with that, and I learned a lot, you know. And it wasn't until I was about 14 or 15 that the actual historic restoration began. You know, where we're walking now, I remember this as the original track bed. Right. But being 35 years ago... Yeah. This isn't actually the original track bed, No, is no. What, what happened here? It's at the original site, but because of the flooding and everything through the years... Um, the level had dropped considerably. I mean, this was just filled with sandy soil. Yeah. Um, and basically, the flooding just made it impossible to put a railway in. And the level had dropped so much that we needed to raise it to actually make it safe. I mean, if, if you're going to put a railway in, you want to know that you know, your investment is going to be safe. So um, what we did is we took all the sandy sediment out and we put in new compactable soil um, and we laid a bed of road planings and this was I mean it looks considerably little now but when it was actually laid uh, when the works were done um, you know it was a major event and I couldn't do it on my own so I had a local company Samco who came and uh, helped me I mean there's 400 plus tons of material gone into this yeah um, but one of the main problems is we've got no road access. The, the site is completely isolated. And that's one of the main reasons it's a private railway now. So we had to think about this problem. And the way around it was to use tractors yeah. and twin axle trailers that could negotiate the terrain. Uh, and this was done over about a four month period. Uh, and uh, they came in over the fields bringing this hardcore and so on, and it made hell of a mess, to be honest, and, uh, and uh, I had a bit of explaining to do up at the house, you know. And, uh, the family were all right with the upheaval? Um, it yeah. Massive upheaval. It was. I mean, they were working, I seem to remember, on Christmas Eve, and that didn't go particularly down well up at the house. So, um, yeah. Uh, so yes, but I, I made a, a deal with them, and uh, luckily the finishing of the work coincided with a with a gap year from college. And of course, at this point, if my recollection serves me right, the track actually dove off in that direction to a station, station. about 100 yards over there. That's right. Yeah, it, it, you can see just the dip in the formation there. But here, what we've had to do is we've unfortunately lost the original 
station site due to a housing development. So what we've done is put a dog leg in the last few yards of the track. But essentially it leads to um, a recreation of the original shed area. Um, but to, the problem is, is where we wanted to put the station, which is on an old disused tennis court, um, there's a great big valley in between the new station site and the old track bed. So what happened was my friend Peter Dawson, who's an original Hilton driver and is now an engineer, he, he came with me uh, to the site here and um, with his dumpy level uh, did the levels and we worked out luckily that there was only a foot difference between the old tennis court and the track bed. So we only had to climb a foot to get back. So a foot from one to t'other, yep. but of course the ground level down here it's is considerable. What, about, yeah, it's about yeah. four foot four below foot. the track bed. Yeah. So what have you got under here? Under here. Well, what it is is we started with. Well, very originally we had we dug the trenches for a breeze block wall, which is was done by a Duke of Edinburgh award team, and uh, then um, a friend of ours, um, Mr. Molyneux, built breeze block walls. Uh, to the desired level and that showed us the level from start to finish and then uh, Samco, a local um, agricultural engineer company, they filled in the embankments to our levels with compacted hardcore and then a bed of road planings to a laser level from one end to the other. Really. So what we've got here is actually, it, it's almost a viaduct, it's a, it's a built structure all the way, running all the way there, all which the has just bend. been infilled yeah. and and filled to the side. Yes, that's correct. Um, Extraordinary. Um, it job. was a it was a it was a big job, and uh, you know we had tractors, two tractors with eighteen ton trailers on the go for two or three months, just dumping spoil in in this area. There was just mountains of soil, uh, and luckily we had a couple of track machines that sculpted it all and 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 made it uh, amenable, and then. But it still looked quite something when we, we'd finished it. And the extraordinary thing for me is actually, when you look back at that, it's, uh, it's completely established. Yeah. Um, as, as our friend Bob Symes would, would point out, it looks as if it's always been there. Yeah. And that's, that's really quite a remarkable achievement. It, it doesn't look like a, a man-made addition, Structure. what have you. Mm. We're fortunate, really. Mm. Because the original railway, of course, being there, that the trees are already mature and we can just slot the railway back in, you know. And that's been really what I've enjoyed the most, just keeping it, you know, as if it had always been there. And, and I'm fortunate that the land allows that to, to happen. Because, I mean, we've all seen railways, very new railways, on, say, a flat field site where they've, you know, put artificial hills and cuttings. And it's always, the thing with Hilton is, is nothing's done unless it needs to. Yes. Uh, everything does a job. I have to say, very well worth the effort.